Hi everyone, this is Eric from the Centic team. It's been a while since my last lab cut, so I thought it's about time to give an update. Today I'm going to talk about the seven pillars for the future of AI. So uh, this sounds very prophetic, but actually it's more of a research manifesto for us Centic team to know what to focus on in the next few months or years, but also as a call for collaboration for anybody who's interested in working in these topics. Uh, the first pillar for as trivial as it may sound is multidisciplinarity, but we believe it's very important today uh, when in the era of LLMs, everybody is just using mathematical models to work with language. Uh, but there are decades of studies in linguistics and semiotics that are still very important. Then if you work in affective computing like we do, you shouldn't ignore the literature on the psychology of emotions, for example. Philosophy also very important today. One of the co-authors of this paper is, a, is from the School of Philosophy and also the arts. Now, I'm sure you heard the inclusion of uh, arts in the traditional STEM discipline so that we go from STEM to STEAM. Uh, next, task the composition, very important. When we optimize a classifier for a specific task, sometimes we forget about all the subtasks that are required. Uh, to properly tackle that task. An example is um, word sense disambiguation for sentiment analysis. If we don't have a submodule that takes care of that, we're basically forcing the classifier to implicitly take care of that, and that could be a mistake. Parallel analogy is, a, is an old concept by Marvin Minsky, but still very relevant today. It's about having redundant representation of the same data so that we can switch to different ones when problem solving starts to fail. The central pillar is symbol grounding. This is very important. Let's not forget that for large language models, words are just a sequence of letters, meaning it's not really grounded anywhere. So if we have a, a way to somehow represent or visualize that, for example, generating X means a transition from a state of non-existent of X to a, a state where X exists in the current operating environment, then that would be definitely beneficial for reasoning. Similarity measure is about uh, introducing new metrics that are topology aware. Uh, many works today are, are building better and better um, multidimensional vector space for data representation, but they're still using uh, outdated similarity metrics like cosine similarity. So you can have two data points in a vector space that they are very near from a Euclidean point of view, but maybe they are completely different because they belong to two different manifolds. Or you can have uh, different kinds of similarities at play. For example, uh, if you take joy and sadness, they are very similar semantically because they are both emotions, but effectively they are completely different. Intention awareness is also important, relates to situational awareness and theory of mind. It's important to have a, some sort of um, idea of what are the intentions of the user, do a bit of user profiling to better perform uh, sentiment analysis or uh, for dialogue systems. Last but not least, we have trustworthiness. Uh, this is very important nowadays. What, how do we define trust? How can we trust an AI system? So if you are interested in this discussion, you can check this paper also in IEEE Intelligence System about responsible recommender system. Here we also discuss about the positive and negative impacts that AI has on society. So that's about it for the seven pillars. You can find the link to the paper in the description. Uh, this is actually the natural evolution of a research roadmap that we devised some 10 years ago, uh, in which we predicted how NLP is evolving through uh, three different uh, curves. And we apply that also in the context of task decomposition by uh, taking care of all the, of most of the subtasks that are required for polarity detection. In the latest version of SentiNet, our common sense knowledge base for effective computing, we also do something similar uh, in terms of three layers of normalization. The first is about uh, looking at uh, how many meanings we can build on top of uh, 
conceptual primitives or, or root words. And this is also includes uh, removing, for example, plurals and stop words and uh, verb inflections. And semantic normalization does something similar, but on a semantic level. So by generalizing multi-word expressions like the ones that you see here into conceptual primitives. The last step tries to apply symbol grounding. So once again, a word like by is just a three letter word for a large language model. But what does by mean actually? We can try to ground this as and define it, for example, as a transfer of ownership. And this is interesting for several reasons. If we have some sort of universal symbolism that tells us uh, what's happening, what's the current state of affair at T and, and at T plus one, then we have a better idea of what's happening in the operating environment. It's like we can somehow visualize what's happening. So this is interesting also because it's a uh, it's a kind of universal symbolism like you have in uh, mathematical uh, symbols or musical notes. But this can also help to handle the richness of natural language and ambiguity, for example. Uh, not to mention also that it can help with multilingual analysis because once you have this kind of universal representation, then supposedly it's valid for all languages. So this all falls under the name of Neurosymbolic AI. And if you're interested in this, you can watch my previous lab casts. And the idea here is not just to in increase accuracy, but also increase transparency. And finally, also look at different kinds of reasoning, because as you know, subsymbolic systems mostly um, emulate inductive reasoning, but there are many other kinds of reasoning at play, like deductive and abductive reasoning. So we uh, have this uh, seven umbrellas of research that I will briefly discuss here once again uh, to find possible collaborators as well. Uh, one is explainable sentiment analysis. This also relates to trust. Uh, how do we make something uh, uh, explainable and, and, and trustable? So in this work, we also describe what are we looking for in explanations? Are we just happy to have explanations together with outputs? We should also look at how useful these explanations are and how robust and most importantly, how faithful are these explanations really telling us how the system came up with these outputs or are they just AI generated? Next is personalized sentiment analysis. This is also uh, very important for better sentiment analysis. You can only do good uh, polarity detection if you know something about the user, if you know their personality, if you know their personal preferences and so on. And we also work in, in multimodal interaction. And here what's interesting is also uh, how you fuse different data and how you build an attention mechanism if you do early or late fusion and so on. Multilingual, as I said, also very interesting. In this recent work, we look at semantic variations of similar concepts in different languages by aligning different languages using some key or anchor concepts. Multitask, as I said, relates to task decomposition. It's, it's important sometimes to handle different tasks using, for example, a multitask learning architecture. Financial sentiment analysis is a very exciting topic. Uh, we use uh, financial reports, news, and, and sentiment analysis together with stock market uh, data to make explainable prediction for financial advisors or for uh, portfolio management in general. Last but not least, conversational sentiment analysis is about creating a, a model for the emotional state of the user throughout the conversation. I want to leave you with the list of our projects. You guessed it, there are seven. Uh, the first, it goes without saying, is AI for business intelligence. So we use these fine-grained an explainable system to better understand strengths and weaknesses of businesses, but also by looking at the products and services of their competitors or, for example, dupes that are very popular today with Gen Z. Uh, AI for social media monitoring, we look at social media to monitor how the opinions of people are changing towards specific topics like nuclear energy, climate change or wildfires. 
being in education, of course, we also apply AI in education to monitor, for example, excitement or frustration in students during the learning process. AI for social good is something that we are doing extensively recently. We looked at understanding movements like a Me Too movement, uh, what's happening in the LGBT community, but also geopolitical issues. Uh, we also apply our system to healthcare, more recently focusing a lot on mental health care. So tasks like uh, explainable depression detection from text and facial expressions, but also suicidal ideation detection. Uh, we also look at toxicity detection, for example, for cyber harassment or cyber bullying. And we don't just look at the intensity of toxicity, but also at the different types of toxicity. And finally, also AI um, for the arts. It can be um, useful for the arts as well as the arts can be useful for AI for visualization, for example. So that's about it for today. Uh, you can find downloads and code and APIs at the usual link. If you want to keep yourself updated, please follow us on Meta X or subscribe to this channel. Uh, thanks for watching and see you next time. Ciao.